Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on microservices interview question. Do you know friends that despite the widespread belief that microservices are nothing more than a hype, notable companies like Netflix and Amazon have all switched from the monolithic systems to the microservices. And if you are a backend developer and preparing for microservices interview questions, watch this video till the end. Now before we head on to discussing microservices interview questions, do not forget to hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon. So let's start with the first question. Explain microservices architecture. The term microservices architecture refers to an architectural design approach for creating applications. Using microservices, a huge program can be divided into smaller independent components each with an own set of responsibilities. A microservices based application might use numerous internal microservices to assemble its answers in order to fulfill a single user request. Each microservice in a microservices architecture is a standalone service designed to accommodate an application feature and manage certain duties. To resolve business issues, each microservice interacts with other services using straightforward interfaces. Microservices are frequently used to hasten the development of applications. Java-based microservice architectures, particularly those based on Spring Boot, are widespreadly used. It's also popular to contrast service-oriented design with microservices. While both have the same goal of decomposing large monolithic apps into smaller components. Now, let's proceed to the question number two. It says, name three tools commonly used for microservices. The three tools commonly used for microservices are as follows. First is Amazon SQS, which means that simple queue service offered by Amazon. Next is Java framework called Spring Boot. And third is Postman. Now let's move to the question number three. It's kind of an easy question. The question says, what is monolithic architecture? The conventional unified model for the construction of a software application is called as monolithic architecture. Monolithic here refers to something that is made entirely of one material. The components or functionalities of monolithic software are strongly tied as opposed to the loosely coupled as in modular software programs, which makes it self-contained. For code to be executed or compiled and software to run, each component and all of its related component must be present in a monolithic architecture. Multiple components are integrated into a single substantial application in a single tiered monolithic apps. Since they frequently have enormous code bases, managing them over time can be challenging. If I talk about microservices in comparison to the monolithic architecture, microservices are discrete, self-contained and deployment modules. Comparatively speaking, scaling is less expensive than monolithic architecture. Microservices are autonomously governed services. As needs changes, it can support an increasing number of services. It lessens the effect on the current service. Instead of updating the entire application, it is possible to modify or upgrade each service separately. Microservices gives us the ability to create applications that are organic in nature, applications that grow by incorporating new features or modules. In contrast to the complex communication, interpositions, even streaming technology also provides simple integration which can be considered an example of a microservice. The notion of a single responsibility can be also applied to the microservices. In order to improve performance, the demanding service must be installed on numerous servers which are less reliant and simple to test. I hope so, you would have got idea about what is monolithic architecture and I've also told you additionally how microservice differs from monolithic architecture. Now, let's move to the next question. It says that what is Spring Cloud? So, if I talk about Spring Cloud, developers may quickly create 
some of the prevalent patterns in the distributed systems using the tools provided by the Spring Cloud, such as configuration management, service discovery, circuit breakers, intelligent routing, micro proxy, control bus, one time tokens, global tokens, leadership election distributed sessions, and cluster state, which are incorporated by the Spring Cloud. Boilerplate patterns also emerge from the coordination of distributed systems, and by utilizing the Spring Cloud, developers can easily set up services and applications that implement those patterns. They will function effectively in bare metal data centers, managed platforms like Cloud Foundry, the developer's personal laptop, and other distributed environments. Now, let's discuss the next question, which says that, what are RESTful services? RESTful web services are essentially web services built on the REST architecture. Everything is a resource in the REST architecture. RESTful web services are used frequently to build APIs for web applications because they are lightweight, highly scalable and maintainable. You have resources, which means that the resource itself is the first component. Suppose a web server's application has a record of numerous employees. Now, suppose there is a URL given http slash slash intellipart.com. Now one can enter the demand such as http intellipart slash courses. So this command requests the web server to supply the data of the courses provided by the intellipart. Next is request verbs. Request verbs are used to request which are used to express what you wish to accomplish with the resource. When requesting a data from an endpoint, a browser issues a get verb. However, there are other more verbs that can be used such as post, put and delete because it wants to acquire the information of the required courses provided by the IntelliPart. The web browser is actually issuing a get verb so in order to get the required courses. The next is request data. Request data is supplied together with a request in the request body. When a POST request is performed to the REST web services, data is often supplied in the request. The client really informs the REST web services that it wants to add a resource to the server with a POST call. As a result, the request body would contain information about the resource that needs to be added to the server. Then comes the response body. This is the bulk of response. Therefore, in our RESTful API, the web server might return an XML document with all the course details in the response body if we were to fire the query with the request. And the final thing is response status codes. These codes are the common ones that the web server returns with the response. The code 200, which is typically returned if there is no issue when providing a response to the client also serves as an illustration. Now, I will also tell you additionally what are some of the RESTful techniques, such as using the verbs, post, get, put and delete verbs. Are the examples of the REST API, you know, basically using all the represented. Assume for a moment that the location has a defined RESTful web service and employee at the rate intellipart.com. Any of the standard HTTP verbs, including get, post, delete, and put, may be specified by the client when making any request to this web service. What would occur if the client sends the appropriate verbs? Suppose post. Using this RESTful web service, this would be used to add a new course. Get. Using this RESTful web service, this would be used to obtain the list of every course provided by the IntelliPart. Put. Using the RESTful web API, this would be used to update every courses provided by the IntelliPart. And delete. This would be used to delete the courses provided by the IntelliPart. Now, let's move to the next question. What is the role of actuator in the Spring Boot? Now, let's move to the next question. What is the role of actuator in the Spring Boot? So, in Spring Boot, an application that is running in the production 
can access the current state using a project called Spring Boot Actuator, which offers RESTful web services. Without having to code or set up any of the applications, you can also manage and monitor applications usage in the production setting. Seems pretty simple. I hope so you would have got idea about actuator used in Spring Boot. Now let's move to the next question. The next question says, how can you overwrite the default properties of Spring Boot projects? So the answer to this question is through the application property specification. The Spring Boot project's default properties can be overridden in the properties file. For illustration, consider the necessity to define a suffix and prefix in the Spring MVC apps. The properties described below can be added to the application.properties file to achieve this. For the spring.mvc.view.suffix.useJSP and the prefix can be slash web inf for spring.mvc.view.prefix. I hope so you would have got idea about overriding the default properties of Spring Boot projects. Now let's move to the next question. The next question says what do you mean by cohesion and coupling? It's kind of an interesting question and very interesting concept to understand. Now let's understand cohesion and coupling. Coupling is a relationship between software module A and B as well as the degree to which one module depends or engages with the other. Couplings can be divided into three main groups. Module connected to the one other in different ways, tightly linked, loosely coupled and the uncoupled. Loose coupling which can be accomplished through interfaces is a type of connection. Now, if I talk about cohesion, is described as a relationship between two or more components or aspect of a module that works together to achieve a common goal. A module with high cohesion can typically carry out a particular task effectively without requiring communication with any other modules. High cohesiveness improves the module's functionality. Now let's move to the next question. It says that what do you mean by bounded context? So in the domain driven design which deals with collaboration across big models and team, a bounded context is a key pattern. To make huge models more manageable, domain driven design basically divides them into many contexts. Additionally, it plainly describes their relationship. The idea encourages the use of an object oriented approach when creating services connected to a data model and it's also in charge of making sure that data model is both mutable and intact. Now let's discuss the final question which says that what are the fundamental characteristics of microservice design? Discrete component and services in a microservice architecture interact with one another and share data to form the functionality of an entire application. Typical features of a microservice design and architectural include the following. The first one is that it is designed for the business. The capabilities and the priorities of a company are taken into the account while organizing the microservices. The microservice architecture makes use of the cross-functional teams in contrast to the traditional monolithic development strategy where individual teams specialize in different project features such as user interfaces, databases, technology layers or the server-side logic. The second characteristic says that it includes multiple components. Each team is in charge of creating unique goods using one or more distinct message bus services. The third characteristic can be it is decentralized. Microservices are not good fit for traditional centralized governance system because they utilize variety of platform and technologies. Decentralized governance is preferred by the microservices community because it creators strive to produce practical tools that may be used by others to address the related issues. Decentralized data management is supported by microservice design 
just like decentralized governance. Monolithic systems use a single logical database for all application. In microservice application, each service often has its own database. The fourth characteristic is that it is failure resistant, which means that microservices are designed to handle failure, much like well-rounded child. It's entirely feasible that one of the various different and disparate trait service will stop working for whatever reason because they are all communicating with one another. In these circumstances, the client should gracefully exit, leaving running any surrounding services. On the other side, microservice monitoring can assist in lowering the risk of failure. Due to this requirement, microservices are more advanced than monolithic system architecture. The next characteristic is that it has easy routing or a simple routing. Microservices functions similarly to the traditional Unix system in that they accept requests and handle them and provide accurate responses. High-tech systems are responsible for message choreography, message routing and application of business rules in the many other products including enterprise service buses. Microservices are made up of dumb data pipelines and smart endpoints that process data and apply logic. And the final feature that it is evolutionary. Microservice architecture is an evolving design that works well with systems where it is impossible to predict what kind of devices will access your application in the future. Many applications start out as monolithic structure but as new requirements arise, they can gradually be split up into smaller structures called microservices that can communicate with previous monolithic structures through APIs. That was all for today's session. I hope so you enjoyed our today's session on microservices interview questions. Just a quick info guys. IntelliPad provides Java certification online training mentored by industry experts, the course link of which is given in the description below.